Hello, my name is Lilian Agbayebe. I'm glad to come to you with another episode of LA Lenses. I'm a public health practitioner. For the past couple of weeks, I have been talking about intimate partner violence. Many people call it domestic violence. I've done a series, I've talked about how blaming the victim is not an appropriate response to intimate partner violence. It doesn't help us to modify the behavior. It doesn't help us to hold the abuser accountable. I also did a series and said that you can't say to a victim, just leave. Why? Because in public health, we know that there's social determinants of health. And these factors influence a person's ability to make a choice. And so why something might seem simple and straightforward, unless the social determinants of health are addressed, then we really can expect the outcome for the behavior that we are hoping to change. Last week, I spoke about intimate partner violence, and I said intimate partner violence is a public health issue. It's a social justice issue. No, it is not anti-faith. No, it is not anti-culture. And no, it is not anti-man. And so we're not really interested in telling people to stop the religion that they practice or to disregard their religious instructions. We're not really interested in telling people to modify their culture. We're interested in the person as an individual and the quality of life that that person should be able to get. And if the factor influencing that quality of life is something that can be modified, it should be modified and nobody should have to live be below their potential ability. Today, I want to talk about the gender divide. The gender divide, yes. What do I mean by the gender divide? I mean, when we try and put men in one corner and women in one corner when we're talking about intimate partner violence. It may not have happened to you, but it happens to me a lot. When you're talking to someone and you say, she is a victim of domestic violence, people get all defensive, all bent out of shape. Like, men suffer from domestic violence too. Here is the truth. Just because someone says that she is a victim of domestic violence doesn't mean that they're saying that men do not suffer from domestic violence. And just because somebody says that the abuser is male doesn't mean that women cannot be abusers. But we come to these issues in public health from a data-driven perspective. We looked at the data and what the data tells us is what, how we respond in public health. And what do statistics tell us? Statistics tells us that one in four women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime, and one in seven men will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And so it is this difference in numbers that has influenced so many things. But by no means do we say that all abusers are men and all victims are women. Victims are predominantly women and abusers are predominantly men. These factors have also come to play in terms of services that are available. Now, you hear people get bent out of shape also and say, oh, well, they're all the services for women and they're not all the services for men. It's reflective of the numbers. So if you have more women suffering from intimate partner violence, then it goes to say that there should be more services for women. It might interest you to know that if you call around in domestic violence shelters, you'll be surprised to hear how many women they turn away because they do not have enough funding to provide services for all the people who come to them. And so if we're looking at the issue of funding and they're not adequate funding, then we need to be advocating for funding for services across board, funding for services for men and funding for services for women. It's not going to help us to say, let us def fund services for women so that we can fund more services for men because then the women will not be getting the services that they need. And so we have to be able to strike a right balance. We need more funding. We need more funding across board. We need more funding for services for men. We definitely need funding for more services for women. I said the gender divide. And sometimes when I talk about the gender divide and I say that this is not something that we just address arbitrary, we're responding to what the data says. Aha, uh -huh. somebody has a comeback response and somebody says to you, well, you know, men don't report abuses. So if you have this number for men, it's reflective of the fact that men don't want to come out and say they're being abused by their spouse because it hurts their ego. Well, 
Guess what? Women don't always report abuse either. No, no. Women who are in relationship with highly respected people, women who are successful in life, are less likely to report abuse. I know for a fact that we've done some studies and some conversations with women who are in relationship with faith leaders, and they're like, nobody's going to believe me. This person goes to, to church on Sunday, is up there in front of people, is counseling people. Nobody's going to believe me. And so those people are in abusive relationship and they say nothing about the condition of their relationship. Women who are wealthy, women who are successful, also don't say that they're in abusive relationship. Here's one example that you can Google, Carolyn Cox. If you Google Carolyn Cox domestic violence, her story is likely to come up. Now, Carolyn was married and she was a millionaire, married to a millionaire. And I remember one of the documentaries I watched on Carolyn's story. She said each time she had the wound, she told her friends that, oh, she fell and she hit herself. And so after a while, people just said, oh, clumsy Carolyn is coming again. She must have fallen into something. And nobody was paying attention. And Carolyn wasn't telling anybody. Guess when everybody got to know? When her husband tried to kill her in their $2 million home. So no, this wasn't some poor run-of-the-mill street person. She was a very wealthy, very successful person. And when you talk about underreporting, women underreport abuse as well as men. And so if you take those into consideration, it's underreported, so we really can't measure what is underreported. But I tell you, when we look at the predisposing factors, those are the factors that make it possible for domestic violence to occur. We see that those predisposing factors favor men a lot. What do I mean by predisposing factors? I mean that a lot of us live in patriarchal societies. Patriarchal societies, they say the man is always right. The man can do whatever he wants to do. The man cannot be questioned. These are not factors that makes it easy for a man to be held accountable for his behavior. We live in societies that are faith-based and a lot of faith teachings that say that once you're in a relationship, you stay in a relationship. These are not factors. And these factors, by the way, support the men in the relationship says wives submit unto your husbands and people use the scripture distort the scripture and use it to hold their wives in oppression so when you look at the things in society it supports men practicing abusive behavior so if you take the predisposing factors into consideration and you take the fact that both men and women under report when they're exposed to intimate partner violence then I think that we can come down on the side that says that intimate partner violence is something that happens to both people but predominantly affects women. Women are most likely to be victims and men are most likely to be abusers. Intimate partner violence occurs in same-sex relationships so we definitely know that women are abusers because women are abusing women that they're in relationship with. But it also happens in heterosexual relationships such that women are abusing men, and we do know that. But you are more likely to hear a story of a female victim because of the number of people that are around that are exposed to domestic violence. I've worked in a couple of shelters, I've been around a couple of shelters, and I have a lot more stories about women who have been victims and the abusers have been men. And if I stand here to tell you a story about somebody who is a domestic violence victim, I am by no means saying that men are not victims of intimate partner violence. We have to strike the balance. What we're interested in public health is really for there to be no intimate partner violence in our communities. We want no male victims, no female victims, no male abusers, no female abusers period. And I think that when we focus on this gender divide, we do not come together to unnest our strengths so that we can fight the enemy. The enemy really is the behavior, intimate partner violence behaviors. Those are the things that we need to modify in our communities. We need to work at, we need to make sure people are in healthy relationships. People know how to cope with stress and anxiety in their lives. People need to learn how not to be modeling harmful and unhelpful behavior for this generation that is coming behind them. 
Those are the issues that we need to focus on. If we begin to do this, all of this, yeah, well, but men suffer from abuse too, and it's almost the same that, so because men suffer from abuse too, we can't talk about female uh, victims, or we can't talk about services for victims. Yes, there is a need for more services. I am going to be on the forefront advocating for funding whenever this possible. But as much as we need funding to fund services for men, we also need services for women. And that's why the fact that we see that there's more services for women, it's not a function of the fact that we're saying that men are not victims. The number of services that you see for women is a function of the fact that women are predominantly victims of domestic violence. My name is Lillian Agbe, where I'm coming to you from the rest of her life. The Rest of Our Life is a non-profit organization and one of our areas of specialization is domestic violence education and advocacy. You can send me an email at the rest of our life at gmail.com. The rest of our life is one word at gmail.com. You can send me a direct message if you'd like to and I'd like to hear from you. Next week I'm going to be talking about domestic violence again and one of the things I thought to talk about is child support. It might not be relevant to you where you are, but because the world is a global village because of social media, I know that people get engaged in a conversation about intimate partner violence and child support. And there's some issues that when people are having this conversation, you just know that a piece of the jigsaw puzzle is missing because people are having this conversation based on misinformation. So I'm going to be here to share some information about child support and intimate partner violence next week. I hope you're listening to this video. If you find this very informative, please share this video. We cannot end intimate partner violence with the level of knowledge and awareness that we have in our community today. People think it's something that is anti-men, anti-cultural. It's something that, you know, we need to blame the victim. We need everybody, everybody, everybody. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody to get involved with this campaign. It's not a problem of the abuser. It's not a problem of the victim. It's a problem of everybody because our communities and our societies are being affected directly or indirectly by the effects of intimate partner violence. My name is Lilian Agwewe and putting you on call to end intimate partner violence. Thank you.